We're thrilled to have Tim here tonight to open Science Festival and set the tone for the entire week. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tim Flannery as tonight's keynote speaker. Turn on my microphone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Haley, for those very kind words. Um, I guess I'm here this evening and I'm in front of audiences quite often, or I'm writing about climate change quite often, because of the future that, that you represent and your generation represent. Um, you know, we talk blithely about 2050 in climate circles quite often, um, and you know, you, you, you read the projections and they're not very pretty. Yet we fail to understand that your generation is going to be at the prime of their life in 2050. It's not very far off. It's 34 years off. And given the complex nature of the world and the challenges we face, I think we all understand we need to really start making a difference now. We can't leave it till 2030 or 2020 even. We need to start now. So that is, uh, I guess, why I have been so passionate about climate change for so long. I can see the world changing in, in, in really quite de deleterious ways and we have to stop that. I want to just um, take it tonight at least take a really clear-eyed look at where we are in terms of climate change, what the impacts are, and I think over the last six months we've learned a tremendous amount about um, how climate change may start to unfold, how climate impacts may affect ecosystems uh, around the world. So I want, to, I want to touch on that. Then I want to look at science in the broadest sense, so, and, and the, the difference science can make. Not only the sort of science we think of as typical climate science or any of the related sciences, but as far afield as engineering or even political science, uh, social science, I won't go as far as, I don't believe economics is a science, we'll leave that to one side, <laughs> but, uh, but every other contribution perhaps might be worth, worth having a look at. And then have a bit of a look at 2050 and how far away it is in terms of the incremental steps that we need to take. So let's start by just having a look at the scale of the current problem. You know, it's taken us 200 years of industrialisation and the use of fossil fuels to get to where we are today. And by and large, over that 200 years, whenever the global economy has grown, the use of fossil fuels has grown. And today we combust about enough fossil fuels on an annual basis to produce about 32 gigatons of CO2. Now, there's other sources of CO2, greenhouse gases, uh, that humans generate coming uh, from non-fossil fuel related sources that take the total up to about 40 gigatons annually for, the, for our species. And if you then add the other greenhouse gases on top of the CO2, best estimate is it takes us somewhere close to 50 gigatons of what people call CO2 equivalent. So it's a very, very large stream of, of gas that we're putting into the atmosphere of gases with uh, warming potential, um, varied depending on the nature of the greenhouse gas that you're looking at. It's interesting though to try to get a sense of how large that stream of pollution actually is. You know, one way I've started to think about it is what would we need to do if we wanted to say take one tenth of that stream of pollution out of the atmosphere? And, and do it doing, using a method we all understand, planting trees. You know, we all know that trees grow from carbon dioxide absorbed through their leaves and they incorporate the carbon into all of their tissues. And you look at a tree, you've got a fair idea of how much CO2 it's taken in and how much carbon it's sequestered uh, through its life. So imagine how big an area would we need to plant to, say, take five gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere every year. Turns out you'd need to plant an area about the size of the contiguous 48 states of the USA to do that in very, very round figures. And because trees all start small, little seeds, you know, I mean, you've got to grow them for 50 years and keep them well watered and growing and so forth over that whole period um, to on average take out about five gigatons of CO2 per annum. So, you know, we're talking here about 
volumes of carbon, at least, or CO2, that register on the planetary scale. Well, they register in terms of ecosystem function at the global level, I think. So, you know, we, we can measure that in, in, in many ways. We can see it through climate impacts, but we can also see it just through the sheer volume of CO2 that we would need to take out were we to uh, reverse our current course. One of the important things to understand about Earth's climate is that it doesn't respond one-on-one -on -one to CO2 in the atmosphere. There are a whole series of things that affect the extent of the warming at the surface of our planet. And so sometimes it slows for a bit, sometimes it accelerates. And the beginning of 2016 saw a real marked acceleration of the warming trend. Prior to the beginning of this year, we were just below one degree C of warming on average for the surface of our planet. Um, over the first few months, or first six months of the year, we averaged um, over a three or four month period um, a temperatures of around about 1.3 degrees Celsius. So there was a spike in temperature that came about largely as a result of the El Nino effect that releases heat and um, CO2 from the surface of the ocean. We had a, a huge submarine heat wave push its way uh, towards the Australian coast uh, that produced a whole series of changes that I'll talk about uh, in, a, in a moment. But just to return to that 1.3 degrees Celsius that we've, we've experienced just over uh, the last few months, in some ways that... Uh, Experiencing that temperature spike was a bit like being given a privileged glimpse into the future. Um, because by 2030 or so, the sort of average global temperatures that we saw at the beginning of this year will be the norm, pretty much, in the 2030s. They'll be what the world is like year in, year out. Of course, their impacts on ecosystems will be different because they're not just a, a transient spike, they're there permanently, and, and changes are entrained in a whole series of, of, of things that occur. But having said that, I think it is really worth just having a look at what the world looked like at 1.3 degrees as it was early, early this year. And could I just say as well that one of the things that happened just before the Great Temperature Spike was the global climate meeting in Paris, first global agreement to, to limit greenhouse gases, it was a hugely optimistic moment. It was wonderful to be there. And to see the nations of the world pledge to do their best to keep temperatures towards 1.5 degrees, and certainly below 2, was really inspiring. But here we are, just a few months later, at 1.3 degrees. The truth is there's enough greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over the next few decades to take temperatures to 1.5 degrees, even if we add no more, even if we turned off the lights here this evening and closed all of the coal-fired power plants and left our cars where they are and walked home, we'd still be at 1.5 degrees in a few decades. It takes time for the greenhouse gases like CO2 to reach their full potential. So what was it like at the beginning of the year? Well, I'm not sure what you were all doing at the beginning of this year, but I was madly busy running around making a film documentary called Coast Australia, which took me to some pretty remote areas off the coast of northern Australia. And soon after that, I did work with the Climate Council where we went out and looked at particular impacts of this submarine heat wave and the, the warm conditions on Australia's ecosystems. And I just want to run through a little bit about, about what we saw. I guess everyone's aware of the damage that occurred on the Great Barrier Reef uh, earlier this year. You know, by 2012, half of the Great Barrier Reef's corals were already dead through a whole series of, of impacts. Um, this year we lost 22% of the, the remaining corals. Um, I went out to have a look at what was occurring on the Great Barrier Reef and was really quite shocked. You know, I, I've dived on the Northern Barrier Reef on numerous occasions and uh, that has always been a sort of a, a somewhat protected part of the reef, the northern third of the Great Barrier Reef. The warming we've seen previously has been occurred further south where there's a very large, uh, wide and shallow lagoon and insulation, just sunlight can heat it up and if it isn't stirred about, the heat will kill the corals. This event this year in the northern part of the Barrier Reef wasn't like that at all. It was, as I said, literally a huge underwater heat wave that rolled in from the east, sat up against the barrier and killed the corals. 
I visited Opal Reef, which was always the kind of jewel in the crown, you know, 90% plus cover of live coral on the reef. Uh, when I saw it in May, uh, it was 90% dead corals, um, you know. Uh, the, the, the kind of stony ones that don't branch very much were doing a little bit better than some of the other corals. But I've kept in touch with the people that took, it, took us out to the reef in May, and they reported that even as late as July this year, there was still bleaching among those surviving corals. So some of the large stony corals were still bleaching in July. Really unprecedented circumstances. When you think about what it would take to, for Opal Reef to repair itself, well, when I saw it, the, the coral was not only bleached but dead, and algae was beginning to grow on it, the fish were starving, the ecosystem was in change. So what will happen over the next few years is that that coral will become thickly covered in green algae, it'll break down, the algae will sit as a mat on the bottom, um, there'll be very few healthy live corals spawning in the area, and that, along with the algae will prevent the settling of new corals to any great extent on that broken up mass. And the situation will prevail that way until a big storm event occurs, maybe a cyclone that will sweep that reef back to bedrock basically. Um, and then if there are some healthy corals in the area that are spawning, that will start a settlement process that will take some decades for the reef to build to the diversity that I saw it or that you could have seen it in prior to May this year. The trouble is that by 2030, this year, the conditions that led to the death of the reef this year are going to be average. Is there time for that reef to recover? I think, my guess is there isn't. I think that damage is permanent, is done. I hope to be proved wrong, but I very much fear that that's not the case. And, you know, when I was in the water, it, it, was, it really came home to me why marine organisms are so susceptible to global warming, why coral reefs are. You know, then they, if you're in the water, you can't sweat like us. You can't transpire to lose heat. You know, you're stuck in it. If you can't move, you are actually stuck in this very, very hot circumstance. There's nothing you can do. So those marine organisms just have to sit there till the heat dissipates. And when we get these extraordinary conditions, it just doesn't dissipate in time. So the reef, we know, is being damaged very severely and will continue to be damaged by climate change. But it's not the only part of northern Australia's ecosystems which are having impacts. Uh, up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, we saw death over hundreds of hectares of uh, mangroves just because of the hot, dry conditions. They couldn't, couldn't tolerate them. I hadn't anticipated mangroves being on the casualty list, but there, there you are. We've seen marine turtles now have a big impact from climate change. Rising sea levels are meaning that nesting sites on places like Rain Island are, are, are being are inundated by salt water and we're losing uh, turtle reproduction. There's very elevated mortality of eggs on some of those turtle nesting sites as sea levels start to rise. Rising sea levels have also caused the first extinction of a mammal um, which we can directly attribute to climate change on the Great Barrier Reef. The bramble key melamies, a rodent, about so big, lives on an island in, or used to live on an island in the eastern um, Torres Strait, has become extinct just over the last five years or so as a result of saltwater intrusion into some um, freshwater swamps that the species totally depended on. One of the things that surprised me when I went to the Buccaneer Archipelago off the northwest of Western Australia to do filming was to see evidence of mass fish death and really big fish dying. This is a pristine part of Australia, the most pristine reefs, tidal, tidal variants of 11 metres or so. You know, everyone you speak to in the, the reef uh, uh, science group would say that would be the most robust reef you'd get. After all, they sit out in the sun for part of each day, you know, with, 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 uh, with, when it's low tide. There was bleaching there and there was mass fish mortality there. Just because in the warm water, when the water gets very warm, it doesn't hold as much oxygen. Large energetic fish just don't have the, the oxygen available to keep them alive. And we saw fish uh, washed up on the coast in, in various areas there. Um, Barramundi in, in the Great Barrier Reef area were incidentally suffering um, similar. They weren't dying, but they were stressed. In May, when I went to Hinchinbrook Island uh, with someone who runs Barramundi uh, fishing trips, 
they, they put their barramundi fishing um, for, uh, work on hold because the fish just weren't biting. Water temperatures in May were still 27 degrees in the areas where they fish until they dropped to 25 barramundi remain inactive in presumably deeper pools where it's a little bit cooler and where they can find some sort of refuge. So my takeaway, I guess, from all of just seeing all of those impacts earlier this year is that we're not seeing only the death of the Great Barrier Reef as we know it. We are seeing a mass turnover of ecosystems, perhaps just the beginning, the first faltering steps of a massive turnover of ecosystems and their function across northern Australia as climate change continues to bite. Now, the extent that that happens, um, I think, is entirely uh, unknown at present, but the one thing we can say is that it will be driven over the medium to longer term by the extent that we keep adding to the problem. So that, I think, is, is, is just axiomatic. So I came away from those experiences pretty depressed. I also had pneumonia, by the way, as I was diving on the Great Barrier Ridge. It didn't add to my uh, uh, good feelings. But, um, but um, I did come away from the whole thing fairly depressed. Um, and I threw myself back into work around what I see as combating the problem, really, and started reading uh, what I could and doing what I could in that area. And I'll explain a little bit more about that soon. I guess the really good news that we received um, by the middle of the year came from the International Energy Agency, and that news was that for two years running now, the scale of emissions have flatlined, so they haven't grown. And this is the first time ever, as long as the IEA has been keeping, International Energy Agency has been keeping data, that they've seen the economy grow but emissions stall. Now that's unbelievably good news. It's good news because if you look at any of the projections, if any of you have read Jürgen Rander's book 2052, you'll know the story. No one was expecting emissions to start declining until 2030 or thereabouts. If, in fact, we're starting to see emissions peak in 2014, that's incredibly good news. It gives us some breathing space. Emissions are peaking at a very high level. They're peaking at about 32 gigatons per year, which is a lot. And we won't know for some years whether in fact that is a peak or just a pause in emissions growth because you never know that you've reached a peak until you've gone a fair way down the other side. But nevertheless, I take it as a very good sign that we're seeing, we're seeing that. And I think that what that's due to really is that, you know, if you look at the, the Paris Agreement, the details of the agreement are sort of irrelevant in a way to the sentiment that they give rise to. Now, Paris says uh, the countries that signed that agreement will start acting on by 2020. So starting in 2020, they'll act to reduce emissions. But what we're seeing, in fact, is a, it's a shift in human sentiment. We know now that the end of the fossil fuel era is coming. People are acting now, in fact, or pre-positioning now to do things. Um, so the agreement itself is not, it's not the pen on paper detail, it's the shift in human sentiment that I think is really important and that I hope drives us through even further. Maybe some social scientist can explain to me how that happens and why it happened in 2015 and didn't happen in 2009 when we all worked our backsides off to get Copenhagen to be a success. But anyway, it's happened. It seems, I think, that there, there, is, that, there is that shift. I'd like to just turn now to some of the remaining roadblocks, I guess, on our way to reducing emissions as fast and as hard as we really need to. And, you know, all of the, the you know, as I said, the, the political agreement is we want to stay below two degrees. Um, in order to have any hope of doing that, we need to have decarbonised our economies by 2050 and develop technologies that allow us to draw some CO2 out of the air cost effectively, which a point I'll come back to in a moment. But I just want to look at the roadblocks in terms of reducing emissions at the moment. And I think that many of us in the climate area haven't correctly identified what those roadblocks are. I've been thinking long and hard about them since the rise of Trump and the Brexit vote in the UK and the rise of Pauline Hanson in this country. And I think that all of those phenomena are interrelated and are an integral part of the problem that we face in terms of reducing emissions. And the problem in a nutshell, as I see it, is that previously disadvantaged communities, communities where wage growth has been slow, where there's been 
uh, drift of jobs to, to developing countries um, where for one reason or another things haven't been going well. They're the same communities that really bear the brunt of the shift away from polluting industries. They're part of the old economy, they're part of the old highly polluting economy, whether it's manufacturing, steel, aluminium, coal, whatever, they're part of that economy. And in a democracy it is extremely difficult to move forward where you have a substantial group of previously privileged people who stand to lose a lot from, from any, any move. I think that's why One Nation did so well up in, up in Queensland, in Herbert, you know, where the old um, nickel refinery is being closed down, where there's a lot of unemployment due to the coal industry shedding jobs left, right and centre. So how do, we, how do we deal with that particular roadblock? I, I spent three years of my life as climate commissioner. I met tens of thousands of Australians right across the country. Um, I spoke to many, many of them individually. Um, I've got great faith in human nature, I really do, and I think people recognise a reasonable deal when they see it. I don't think we've offered it to them yet. What we haven't done for those people is to say, we need to really restructure our, uh, the way we look at our economy in order to give you a better, better deal out of this. We need to redistribute wealth. We need the wealthy to actually start paying in a serious way for some of this transmission. A transition, sorry. Um, and it is a really big transition. I mean, if you think about it, just, you know, at the moment, estimates are that we need to spend about 1% of GDP a year to, to decarbonise that to 2030. That roughly equates to 1% of jobs changing. Yeah? So they, they'll be lost in those old, dirty parts of the economy, which are often regionally concentrated, and they'll be created in new parts of the economy. But the people won't be doing the same jobs. You need different skills. You need different sort of life experience. So I think that that we need to rethink our politics in this. We need to get much more serious about a much more equitable transition than we have before, because I really do believe that that is one of the big roadblocks that we as a nation face. I know that's outside science, but it's within social science and political science, and we're yet to find a way uh, to make that transparent and evident that we all have to give something, I think, for this transition to really start taking hold. So our, our, our politics are lacking at the moment uh, in that area and that is, that is certainly holding us back. But there is no doubt that even with the best will in the world and the best politics in the world, uh, we need significant innovation and development of technologies if we're to overcome this problem. I want to talk about two kinds of technologies in my remaining time. I'm running out of time very quickly, I can see, but I'll be fast as I can. Um, I want to talk about new clean energy technologies and we're, we're quite, kind of familiar with those. Wind and solar are doing incredibly well um, and will continue to do well into the future, although they'll be quite challenging to us, I think. Um, you know, to give you an idea of the, the trajectory of those technologies, solar PV uh, has doubled, the installation of solar PV has doubled every two years for the last 14 years. If it doubles every two years for the next 12 years, it will be supplying all of the electricity that humans require. But of course that's not going to happen because we can't store that stuff adequately yet and at scale yet. We don't have the battery technologies yet to allow that to happen. Um, so I think that we've got a, uh, there's, there's great prospects for growth there, but we need other technological developments if we're to allow those technologies uh, to play the full role that they may do. There are new technologies on the horizon which offer some incredible opportunities for us. One of them is uh, concentrator solar thermal technologies. It's a very immature field of technological development. There's, there's three or four major ways of generating energy from concentrating sunlight. Um, some of them have turned out to be dead ends. I don't know whether you've heard of the Avanpa CST plant in California. It's the largest of all of the CST plants. It's nearly 400 megawatts in scale, three gigantic towers, they glow incredibly with the light because of the heat energy. There's a thousand degrees Celsius heat developed up around these things, mirror fields that go nearly a kilometre. Um, the only problem with those technologies, well not the only, one of the big problems is they keep cooking birds. You know, birds are attracted to the insects, they fly in, go out, smoking, the other end, cooks them on the wing. 
3,500 birds, including rare and endangered species, cooked on the wing by a vampire. And that's a, just a very minimal estimate. So there are things we have to do, different ways that we have to approach those technologies. I'm involved with an Italian technology called STEM, which is a little, only half megawatt scale plants. I know that particular technology very well. It doesn't cook birds. Maybe something like that is going to offer us uh, a, a better way forward. But the most important thing to understand about CST is that it gives you heat as well as energy, electricity. And if you have heat, if you have high quality heat, you can do anything. Um, there's one particular form of CST technology being developed in the US now out of uh, Washington State where uh, a CST plant is being used to break down the CO2 molecule, take the carbon and use that to grow carbon fibre. Can you imagine what that might mean for our future? Imagine if we can do it cheaply. And this professor uh, who has uh, pioneered this particular technology says it is cheaper to do that uh, than it is to manufacture carbon fibre using conventional technologies. If he's right and we can drop the price of carbon fibre, the strongest, lightest material pretty much that we know about, that is a huge challenge to the aluminium industry and to the steel industry, two of the most polluting industries that we face. This professor has done a back of the envelope calculation on, he knows the efficiency of his technology for breaking down CO2. Um, how much of it would you need to break down all the CO2 that we currently put up into the atmosphere in any one year, you need to cover about 10% of the Sahara in his particular form of CST technologies to do that. You generate a heap of electricity, a lot of, lot of heat energy and more carbon fibre than we could possibly even think about using, I'm sure. But nevertheless, it's a really interesting innovation that's just brand new, just August last year that it was announced. So those technologies that offer multiple ways forward are really important. And in, incidentally, CST, you generate steam. Steam gives you clean water. Um, you can use steam to clean soils. 20% you know, of China's agricultural soils are polluted with cadmium. You know, in the developing world, uh, contaminated water is a massive issue. If you're developing distilled water through flash distillation as a byproduct of electricity and heat generation, you've got a great opportunity, I think. So technologies like that are going to be quite important. And those technologies will be slaved to new industries that will transform the way that we live. I was just earlier this year out at Sundrop Farms near Port Augusta. Um, I don't know whether any of you have been out there to have a look at that place, but it's amazing. Um, you go out to Port Augusta and the northern power plant, this terribly polluting old coal-fired power plant, is, was giving its dying gas pretty much when I was out there. Um, it used to be the most, the single uh, greatest point source of radiation pollution in all of Australia because the coal it burned was full of uranium, just uranium, highly mobile in groundwater. Got into the coal, burning it. It was worse than any uranium mine, believe it or not, that old coal-fired power plant. But anyway, um, it's closed down now and the water, the salt water that was used to cool that plant is now going to a place called Sundrop Farms, which is literally pretty much in the shadow of the the old coal-fired power plant. Sundrop Farms is 20 hectares of greenhouses, um, not, a, not a very large area, you might think, but it produces 10% of Australia's trust tomato crop, um, which are the ones you see in the supermarkets, um, using no fresh water whatever and virtually no fossil fuels and absolutely minimal pesticides and virtually no waste. Nothing comes out of it but perfect tomatoes and some cuttings. Um, and that's because at the heart of that Sundrop Farms is a CST plant, a concentrated solar thermal plant that provides all of the heat and electricity that the plant requires to grow those tomatoes in ideal conditions. I mentioned to the manufacturers out there, you know, why don't they diversify and put a cannery in which would be good for local employment? They said they just don't get enough inferior tomatoes to justify a cannery. <laughs> They're all good enough to go straight to market. Quite amazing. Um, and being out there in the desert, the land is cheap, if not absolutely free. Um, there's no, no one's growing tomatoes anywhere nearby to provide pests that can get in. And they've got a very intricate system for keeping pests and diseases out. So Sundrop Farms, an Australian innovation, built on the back of clean energy technology, is incredibly important. What they'll do, I think, in the long term, is turn the least desirable parts of our planet into the most desirable parts from a food production perspective. Anywhere that you've got lots of sunlight and seawater, you can do a sundrop farm. So North Africa, um, 
the, uh, the desert coasts of, uh, of Africa, South America, anywhere around Australia, places where the land has been useless from that perspective, um, I think will become very, very important. I can talk to you a little bit about um, the fate of the salt, the salty water that comes out of those plants, but in short, it's not going to be as big a problem as, um, as I at least had first thought. So I just want to turn now to uh, technologies that can take CO2 out of the atmosphere and make something of them. I mentioned to you the carbon fibre story coming out of the University of Washington, or, uh, sorry, George Washington University, incredibly important, I think. But all of the technologies that we know about that can take CO2, take the problem out of the air and make something with it or do something with it, fall into two great categories. There's the biological means of doing something and the chemical means of doing something. And I want to just deal with biology first. When I began the talk by saying that if you wanted to take five gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere, you'd need to plant the contiguous 48 states of the US in trees. It gives you a sense of the scale of the problem and the limits that terrestrial ecosystems have in addressing this. I think we can do some important things on farm, and I think protecting forests is absolutely fantastic, and we desperately need to do it. But the really scalable solutions to drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere using biological processes are going to be marine. Um, seaweed farming is taking off around the world for a very good reason. You know, seaweeds grow 30 to 60 times faster than land-based plants. It tur turns out that some species are very, very valuable food or fodder products for uh, high-quality uh, marine produce like abalone, abalone. The problem at the moment we have is that all of the seaweed agriculture we have is near shore or onshore. Um, and that means that you are very limited in terms of sequestering the carbon in that seaweed. We recycle it back into the system through using it. There are ambitions, I should say, rather than plans, but there are ambitions to create mid-oceanic seaweed farms. In fact, there's been some experimental work done in this area by both the US and China. And I think that we are ripe to see major new innovation in this area. And I'll just leave you with a vision of that. Can you imagine a seaweed farm that's a square kilometre array that's sunk 25 metres below the surface so it's not a hazard to shipping, that um, is mobile, can move around slowly, maybe you'd put it in the doldrums, um, that pumps up uh, nutrient-rich seawater from 300 metres down and uses that to irrigate the, the kelp farms, that grows on those kelp farms lots of high-quality protein, whether it be prawns, shellfish, abalones, or, or fish, whatever it is, but in that square kilometre array, and uses the kelp to feed those organisms, and that sends to the bottom of the abyss, three or four kilometres down, a, a rain of carbon-rich material caught by biological processes and sent into the depths. Um, because it would be mobile, you wouldn't be building up a problem in, in one area. I think it's quite possible that we could do this and permanently sequester the, the CO2 in the ocean depths where, over geological time, much of it ends up anyway, um, by developing that sort of aquaculture. The biggest problem, well, many, many problems we face, but one very obvious one is that you're a lot further from market out in the middle of the ocean than you are near shore, which is why people do stuff near shore. But if you want the real benefits of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere, you need to somehow make that, that particular um, uh, process work. How much of the ocean would you need to cover with those sort of seaweed farms to be drawn out all of current emissions? Turns out about 9%. An area four and a half times the size of Australia. Large, but not unfeasible. And given that the world is looking at uh, a 69% increase in demand for calories, and particularly a demand for high quality protein, I can imagine markets for all of that aquaculture produce. So just turning briefly to the chemical uh, means of dealing with this. Carbon fibres, one very important one. Use of silicate rocks is another very important one. Silicate rocks are rocks that are formed at the mid-ocean ridge in the ocean. They're often incorporated into uh, continental uh, masses. If you can grind that stuff up and expose it to weathering, it captures CO2 out of the atmosphere. Those rocks are an important part of the carbon cycle on Earth. If you wanted to capture three or four gigatons of CO2, you probably need to grind up five or six gigatons of those rocks. At the moment, quarrying and grinding, that sort of rock demands that we burn a lot of fossil fuel. may not be the case in future. I don't know whether we'll have giant windmills with hammers on them or something that'll be breaking them up. Be some high-tech thing, no doubt. But anyway, there'll be some way, perhaps in future, of using silicate rocks to help draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
Carbon negative concretes is another obvious one. The stuff already exists. We know, we know how to make it. Um, but we need a sec sectoral carbon price in the, in the concrete industry in order to foster that technology, I think. It's important because concrete manufacturers are responsible for about 5% of current emissions, so quite large. A really, really interesting one uh, turned up recently, just late last year. Some researchers from the University of uh, South Korea so, uh, developed the first proposal I saw for capturing a non-CO2 greenhouse gas. There's probably others out there, I just haven't come across them. This one involved the capture of atmospheric methane using a very prosaic material, using coffee grounds. So if you take coffee grounds, treat them chemically and heat them to 900 degrees C, how would you do that? You'd have to use something like CST technology, yeah, concentrated solar, because it's clean green heat. If you do that, the coffee grounds turn out to be absolutely fabulous at capturing atmospheric methane. You can then take the charged coffee grounds and burn them as a very high quality fuel. The researchers who made the announcement said it looked to them to be the best way forward, at least as far as they understood for, uh, for capturing atmospheric methane. And atmospheric methane, responsible for somewhere, I think it's 20 to 25 per cent of current warming potential um, that we're seeing. So some of that sounds, oh, I should just say, you know, it'd be lovely to think, wouldn't it, that every cup of coffee we drink brings us one step closer to sustainability. Well, maybe, maybe it could be. Um, so from 2016 to 2050, we somehow have to take these ideas and thoughts and what might appear to be some madcap notions, we have to take them and capture them and make them massive industries. It seems impossible. I mean, I often hear people say it's just not, not going to happen. But I think it will happen. Maybe not those very industries, but something like them, because we know the demand's there. The, the gas is hanging over our heads. It's not going to go away. We know how it will drive adverse changes on Earth. We know future generations will need to get it out. We need to start the investing now to enable that to happen. Why do I think that this will happen? I think if you just look back on history, you see why. Um, if we just imagine for a moment that we're not in 2016 but we're in 1916 and that we're trying to imagine the world of 1950. Imagine 1916 here in Melbourne, it'd be horse-drawn uh, uh, transport mostly on the streets. We'd have street lights, electric street lights, but homes would be basically powered by mum's muscles, you know, rather than all of the electric stuff we've got at the moment in, in the house. Um, and at school or at university, you would have had a map. If you want to understand the world, you go to a map that would be colour-coded according to the great European empires that hadn't changed for ages. There wouldn't have been a single communist country on that map. And you would have been interested in the war, that's for sure. 1916, big things happening on battlefields in Europe. Um, no tanks yet, though. It would have been September before you got your first tank on a battlefield anywhere. There would have been some aircraft, biplanes buzzing overhead, but not really used for combat, just a for observation. And horses were still playing a massive role in the war. So take that mindset, if you can, imagine being a person in Melbourne at that time with that understanding, and project out to 1950, you know, a world where half the population pretty much is, is communist, where we've had nuclear weapons, um, jet aircraft, uh, where electrification in the home has totally changed things, or beginning to totally change things, where the horse is a, is, is a curiosity in the city, if it exists at all. Still uses farm labour, but, you know, in cities basically banished by fossil fuels. So just it, it, that transition seems absolutely unimaginable, I think, to, we, to anyone with a 1916 mindset. Just as the world of 2050, I think, is unimaginable to us with a 2016 mindset. One of the great resources we need as we go forward is the imaginative space to think about solutions that are required and to give rein to the possibility of developing them. And that's the one resource I hope that young scientists take away from this evening, people studying science. Give yourself the imaginative space to follow your dream into this. Don't let people tell you that it can't be done or it won't be done. Um, we know it can be done and we rely upon you to do it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. And my name is David Caroli. I'm a professor of atmospheric science here in the University of Melbourne. And it's my pleasure and honour to, I guess, moderate this.
question time. Some people were told there was going to be a panel. I don't think two people make a panel. But I get the opportunity, I think, to ask you the first question, Tim. And first of all, thank you for such a broad-ranging discussion of climate change. I know you and I have had private conversations around many of these topics for more than a decade. And one of the things that I say now is, I mean, we've known the science of climate change for a long time. We've actually known about some of these solutions for a long time as well, and we've known it's a problem. And you've talked really eloquently about some of the innovative ways that we might be able to address the problem, both in terms of clean energy technologies and also between some of these new technologies that can draw down carbon. That's fantastic. But I describe climate as no longer being a science problem. Climate change is a people problem. How do we engage people in the vision of accepting these new technologies? And you started to talk about it. How do we engage the audience? How, what can they do and how can they be engaged in these new technologies? Well, that's the, the great question. And could I just say that I think this audience here represents the audience of winners. You know, these are the people who are well educated, they're in cities, they've got great opportunities to become deeply engaged in the new energy technologies or the new technologies as a whole and probably become extremely wealthy from them. But there's a whole lot of other people out there who are not in that privileged position. And they're the ones that we somehow need to bring along with us. And they're the sort of people that I met you know, month on month um, at the Climate Ca Commission meetings when we went out to regional Australia or you know, down to Geelong when they were facing uh, the difficulties uh, that they have down there. So to me, the solution has to start with giving those people what they see as a fair deal, transparently as a fair deal. You know, levels of cynicism in government have gone to unbelievably high levels. I don't accept myself from that observation either. But we somehow need to act as a community to overcome this together. And you, you see successful examples of this. I, I remember back in the 80s when Senator Richardson was trying to protect the World Heritage Wet Tropics, you know, and there was logging communities up in that area which had been there and, and been the, the absolute core of regional communities' economic activity for generations, trying to get that shift to happen. I talked to Senator Richardson at that time and his focus was very much on a just economic transition. Never going to be perfect. There will always be some people who lose their job and can't go on to others, but we need to make a serious effort to, to do that just transition, I think. That's, yeah. Thank you, Tim. So we now have time, about 20 minutes or so, for questions from the audience. So if you've got a question, please raise your hand. And what we're going to do is we've got two roving mics that will be wandering around. And what I'll try to do is please limit the time that you ask the question and try to, I hope, Tim, Answer it in less than 20 minutes. Sure. <laughs> thank you. And the first question is here. Uh, thank you, Tim. Excellent talk. Um, in the absence of any political leadership or courage currently, how do you think Australia is placed in terms of fostering this innovation? For the young people that are in the room today that have ideas, you know, are you seeing it, the way forward as being more driven by industry innovation and engineering than it is going to be by any sort of public policy? I, look, I, I, it's very hard to get away from the need for public policy in, in this area um, for, for a, number of, a number of reasons. One is that uh, if we turn first to those, those technologies which are at the desktop level at the moment or an idea type level, just say, just say there was someone in the room who was interested in seaweed aquaculture or some detail of that or, or uh, carbon fibre manufacture. I mean, you can't just often turn to an industry and ask them to fund that stuff because it's at a very, very fundamental stage. What we, you know, we've got a $1 billion innovation fund in this country to foster innovative technologies and approaches. I would be st strongly recommending to the Prime Minister or the head of the fund that we quarantine a fairly sizeable hunk of that for these new technologies that bear directly on the climate problem because we need that research money, we need the R&D money, we need the angel investors, you know, we need government help all the way through that process till you've got a product that you can actually engage you know, with an industry about. 
So I, 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 I think government's going to have to play a, an integral role in this, you know. And we, we see it even with the, I mean, if you're just talking about energy, you know, tariffs, subsidies, hidden subsidies, subsidies for fossil fuels, yeah, there's no such thing as an even playing field out there. Government's just an integral player in the whole thing, you know. So we do need government to, 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 to work with this, as, as difficult as that is, you know. I think we've got an opportunity. I mean, as far as I know, Minister Frydenberg, the new energy minister, and, um, he's, uh, he's probably the first energy minister we've ever had that's not been the minister for coal as well. He may be the minister for gas, but you know, at least he's the, not the minister for coal. So maybe there's some hope there. Uh, yeah, hi, Tim. Um, in the areas you've visited around Australia, based on your observations and perhaps scientific research, are there any species taking advantage of the changing environments and adapting to it? Look, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I'm not enough of an ecologist to be able to give you an absolutely good answer to that because, you know, you know ecosystems are complex and um, mm. uh, there's, there's a whole lot of factors that have an impact. So, I mean, when you were asking, I mean, the one I was tempted to say that, all well, that algae that grows on the coral, you know. But again, that's like there are fish that normally keep that in in check, you know, so it's a complex ecological problem, so you'd really have to ask an ecologist. I'm sure there are, though. I'm not an ecologist, but the answer is that, in fact, in the northern hemisphere on high-latitude land areas, scrub and trees are growing in the areas at high latitudes which have warmed and the summers have got longer, and, in fact, the net primary productivity of the planet has grown. There's more plants growing now than 30 years ago because it's warmer and there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, that has been used as an argument for why we should continue to increase the CO2. It's a very short-lived argument because it won't continue. Other questions? Thank you, David. Could, could I just add something to that? I mean, one thing we have to understand about climate change is that it's a process. It's not a destination. So what might be good for those scrubs and trees now in a few decades' time might be bad for biological productivity. Yeah, what I want to do is try to avoid the people in the front of the room getting the opportunity to ask questions. So we have a lady in the back. I also like to try to e include as much gender balance in the questions as possible, not give the men the first turn. So the lady in the back, please. Um, thanks, uh, Tim. To what extent, uh, if at all, do you think that universities should be accountable um, for churning out graduates in non-renewable sectors wow, in, in terms of thing. being involved in this transition from non-renewables to renewables? That's a very deep philosophical question. <laughs> 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 I, I don't, you know, I really hesitate to sort of be prescriptive about what universities can teach. In some ways I feel that they, they don't teach enough. I mean, look, I, just from my personal experience, I went to... La Trobe University at a time when I could do a degree in medieval and uh, not a degree, take a course on medieval and old English. You know, you can't do that anymore as far as I know out there. Um, I did a, a fab fabulous course on um, colonial uh, Portuguese and Spanish history. Wonderful. I just think we should teach as much as we can across universities. In terms of the non-renewable stuff, I, I guess really... You, God, you'd hope the market would take care of that. But, you know, again, we, even if you think about petroleum geology or something like that, I mean, there's a lot of really good geology in that and that may be used for good in the end. I mean, if we're looking at, for example, example, putting all that carbon somewhere underground, some of that technology and some of that know-how might eventually be valuable. So I, I really hesitate to, to be prescriptive. And maybe on the same... Note, the university has introduced a sustainability charter which does specifically include the teaching of sustainability as one of the streams within teaching, research and related areas. So, and engagement, and this is obviously part of the engagement on sustainability. Any other questions at the back? And there's another lady on the left-hand side at the back. Hi. Um, you talked about um, 
technologies to sequester carbon. Um, I just like your opinions on the whole idea that we should be looking at how we can sequester carbon when that possibly um, doesn't force us as humans to change our behaviour and to change the way our economy operates. And also, given that we have limited resources devoted to research and development, should we be using those limited resources to figure out how we can sequester carbon or battery storage, for example, with you know really renewable green technologies? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, and I struggled with it, I guess, long and hard when I started to assess this work and I, when I wrote my book, Atmosphere of Hope, that laid out a lot of these technologies. And it seemed to me that there was a moral hazard both ways because um, if, I, if we neglect those technologies, we may be forcing future generations to forfeit a very powerful tool that they'll need to address climate change because we won't have made the investments now to get them to scale. It's also possible that some capital will flow to those technologies which may have been better spent in the clean energy technology area. And I don't have a, I don't have a very precise answer to it beyond saying that I have thought about it and that I think there's a moral hazard both ways. Um, but what I can see is that it's going to be enormously difficult for us to stay below two degrees. And my, my personal conviction is we're going to need every single tool in the toolbox and it's going to be the most cost-effective of those ones that will win out eventually. Here in the front. Thank you. I'm proudly in the front, so thank you for letting me go. <laughs> Tim, you talked about the social aspect of it, and I'm going to unashamedly give a plug to something in a moment, but before I do that, let's consider that we have people, a lot of them, at that lower level where they depend on their car and their job, etc. And they don't see the benefit to them. That's right. However, what if it was about their family and their children and their grandchildren and their life? Now, that's something that's possible, and I'm a graduate of Melbourne Uni and nearly 40 years ago I was started here. I'm now volunteering with the Wilderness Society and there's a thing called the Community Organising Training. I attended that training a few months ago and next week on Monday I'm flying up to do an advanced course. It's all about connecting through the local community, mm -hmm. having leadership, so local issues but with a structure and mm -hmm. a support and a focus that can draw them in and it's through relationship with those individuals and those communities. So my question is, is that a way that you can see is going to be effective and how can we support it? Uh, and I'm doing that. I, I, I am supporting myself. Okay. Look, I, th I think it is, it is worthwhile doing and it's, it's effective, but I don't think it obviates the Im immediate need that people have. Um, can I just tell you one little story from my time as climate commissioner? We went to central Queensland and um, had an audience full of pretty, you know, people who obviously work on the land or in coal mines or whatever, and um, George Christensen, the... the the sceptic um, liberal was, was in the audience as well. And I remember we talked about coal and the, you know, the future of coal and all the rest of it and, um, and about climate change. And Will Stephan gave a fantastic overview of the climate threat. And this bloke stood up, a bit like you, big tall fella, kind of craggy, a bit dirty hands, you know. And he said, <laughs> yeah. He said, look, he said, I, was, um, he said, I understand what happened, what's happened. I said, I used to be a farmer. And he said, I now know that it was climate change that drove me off the land, forced me to sell up. He said, I had to get a job. I've got two daughters. They're nine and 11. He said, I, I, the only job I could get was in a coal mine. He said, tell me, am I doing the right thing? It was just this incredibly difficult moment, you know. And it, all you can say to people like that is, you know, your first priority is to put you know, food on the family's table. You know, that's the first thing. Um, and we hope that as a society we can make a better transition. But I do, it, for a lot of people, it's down to that level. It's down to that. It's a, it's a real threat, you know, the, in these declining communities. And I think we, that's the first and foremost what we need to address with real energy, you know, and commitment to let them know that they're not going to get left behind, that we can do this as a community. Other questions? I'm looking at the back.
Thank you. It seems to me we're getting both recognition and action at the personal level, at the community level, like this gentleman's talking about, at the local council level, at the state level, and even at the international level. It seems to me, though, we're being betrayed by our federal government and by the bulk of our mainstream media. Impossible question, but can you offer us any ways of tackling that? Well, I do think, I think that, you know, if we had a Prime Minister who stood up and said, look, it's, we're going to hock something, we're going to go into debt, we're going to, you know, it doesn't matter about the AAA credit rating, we're going to get this transition right and we're going to take care of people as we do it and here's the long-term plan. And they went to the Leader of the Opposition and said, what do you think about this? Can you give us some input? Whatever. I think we'd have something for the Australian people to support, you know, even if it meant increasing taxes, even if it meant making change, because we'd see the transparent equality of it. Well, that's what political leadership is and um, I don't know, that's... that's one of the things that we're lacking. I, 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 I had great hopes, is all I can say, for our current <laughs> <laughs> Although, on the good perspective, in 2009, Australia had no federal commitment to reduce emissions, mm. and now we have yeah, yeah, yeah. a federal commitment supported by all sides of the politics to reduce greenhouse gas emissions below 2000 levels, significantly by 2020 and 2030. So that, we can look on the negative, but there are a small glimmer of hope. On a longer time scale, there's a lot of glimmers of hope if we can follow what Tim's talking about. But even on the short time scales, there has been political change at the federal level. Absolutely. No small part to the role people like you have played, David, so thank you. And you. <laughs> Other questions? In the middle. Well, no, in the back. In the back. Hi, thanks for your talk today. I was interested in this new technology that you talked about going offshore mm. with the seaweed. Did I hear you mention that you could do that potentially with prawns and fish? Did I understand correctly? And is it published anywhere? That's right, yeah. There's quite a lot published. There's some references in my book, Atmosphere of Hope, but um, there's a there was a... Uh, a symposium held uh, about two months ago in the US by the Department of Energy looking at seaweed farming. And uh, if you go online, you might be able to find that, um, that, that's those symposium abstracts, which is some interesting data in globally. Um, yeah, well, what, basically the story is that the Chinese have been doing uh, aquaculture of, of algae seaweed for centuries. And um, they've got 500 square kilometres of farms now in the Yellow Sea up in that area. And it's quite interesting to see what happens. I mean, the, the seaweed draws in so much CO2, it buffers the seawater and creates a really good environment for growing anything that has a shell, oysters, prawns or whatever else. So these are, seaweed farms are uh, synergistic with, with uh, farms for a whole lot of other high-quality protein. And they're working quite well. Yeah. And there was a question here in the middle. Oh. Just, just wait. There was a... Gentleman behind you, in fact, I saw first. Yeah. Uh, g'day, Tim. Thanks for that. <coughs> Question for you. Uh, I, I heard an interview on the radio about uh, 12 months ago from a representative of the Indian, it was a, some energy person, where they were talking about the difference between localised and, or I call it power generation at the local level and centralised power generation and transmission. And I've done a bit of reading about the losses associated with power, genera power transmission. And uh, her argument was that they didn't want Australian coal. We don't want it. Yeah. It's just not worth the effort. Well, what we want is power generation at the local level, even right down to household or, or very, very close. And I was wondering if there's been any, any um, review or that you're aware of, of the differences in the costs and the losses associated with those sort of differences. Well that, well, that makes a big difference in terms of how people get their power. Yeah, sure. You're quite right. And look, my insights into that, I should say, have come from uh, 10 years on Tata Powers, serving on Tata Powers Sustainability Advisory Board. So I get to see the Indian energy sector quite close up because Tata Power is the largest privately owned energy company in India. So, um, and what, what you see there is that any proposals for developing like large scale infrastructure runs into incredible problems of just land acquisition because of the huge numbers of people in India. So running a transmission line or building a rail line or getting access to water, so you can cool a coal-fired power plant, 
all incredibly difficult. And with the subsidies and the, and the coal tax in India now, it looks as if uh, the price of electricity from solar, PV and, uh, and, and coal is about equal. Um, at the small scale, there's quite a lot happening. So the, the most popular dowry gift in India today is a little solar PV lighting kit, <laughs> which, is, which is used at the village level, which is fantastic. Um, but people obviously need more than that. I mean, they need, they need to be able to cook. At the moment, biomass combustion is used for cooking, and it's just a lot of the pollution haze you see in India is due to that, due to uh, biomass, inefficient biomass combustion. Um, you know, I, with, with Tata, we were looking at, you know, community-scale power plants. The trouble is none of the commercial companies make anything small enough. I mean, demands in Indian villages are so tiny that you, you 40 kilowatt system's too big. You know, you're looking at seven, eight kilowatts. Even if you've got a, a little mobile you know, phone charging system or whatever else you want there. It's a, so it's, it's a very, it's a difficult problem and it's a very dynamic and fast moving situation. But I am quietly confident that India is not going to go through a coal boom such as we saw in China. Um, and certainly the Indian ministers said they want to stop importing coal in the next few years. So we shall see, but I'm I kind of hopeful uh, on India. And now our last question, just gentlemen here in the middle. <coughs> just wait for the microphone, please. You haven't mentioned nuclear energy. Is there any place for it, in your view? Well, look, there's still some nuclear power plants being built. As you know, there's a new one in the UK which is being built. There are, there are a few uh, in, in China being built. There's quite, actually, more than a few. There's some substantial plants being built in China. Um, my sense, though, is that it's only where there's really large-scale government support that those plants are being built. And I think the reason's one about... It's about capital flows, really. Um, if you think about building a nuclear power plant, they've got to be 2,000 megawatts to be, you know, if, uh, to be economically viable. Um, so 2,000 megawatt plant, you know, you're 10 or 15 years in the development from, from go to woe. It's got to run for 50 years to pay you back. Um, it'll tie up billions and billions of, you know, probably 20 billion US dollars of capital to build. And the competition is solar PV that's declining in cost 10% year on year, or wind that's doing a similar sort of thing, and which is modular, where you can buy one wind tower if you want, or one PV panel. And we, so you're not tying up a lot of capital, the returns are instant, there's no fuel needed. Um, you know, so I think that the renewables, um, even the small scale CST plants, concentrated solar thermal um, plants, have got an advantage, an economic advantage over those great big old uh, clunkers. Uh, so I just, I don't think without total government support and commitment to an electricity price act for 50 years, they're not going to get built, in my view. So, Tim, your talk today was the first of the series of talks as part of the Science Festival. If any of you are interested in finding out more about the Science Festival, the website is here. It's got a Twitter handle, of course. I don't know how to tweet, but someone does. <laughs> I think it's my kids. Um, but yes, please find out. There's a whole series of events over the next week. And following that is the University of Melbourne Open Day. So if you've got children or grandchildren who want to come to the University of Melbourne, please come along to the Open Day, which is not this weekend, but next weekend on Sunday. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you. And somewhere here I have some carbon sequestration in the form of <laughs> paper. We usually do alcohol, but we decided that the carbon capture and storage in the paper was a more appropriate mechanism. Old-fashioned <laughs> book. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.